tools. So the focus of my talk today is going to be on, first of all, we'll talk about why do we need to build blood vessels. So touching on some of our previous themes about uh, innovation and identifying needs. Um, and then we'll talk about how the idea of making blood vessels has sort of evolved over time as, uh, as this technology has become more and more enabled. Um, and then I'm gonna talk a little bit about how you know, our lab is thinking about this to meet some, some still unmet needs uh, in this field. Okay, so why on earth would we need blood vessels in the first place? And uh, the, uh, major, the major goal here is to try to meet the need for patients who ha are suffering from some sort of cardiovascular disease. And so uh, the example that's shown here is in the case of a patient who's had uh, uh, a heart attack, had a myocardial infarction. So there's a blockage to one of the arteries in the heart that's cutting off blood supply to the, the cardiac muscle. And if the cardiac muscle isn't working effectively, then the patient has problems, right? So um, one of the ways that's been developed over the decades to try to deal with this problem is to literally bypass that blockage and restore blood flow uh, back to the heart. And so, uh, so the way that this is done is to take another artery and literally suture it on either side of the blockage and restore blood flow. Back to, the, uh, back to the heart. So in order to do this, you need to have a blood vessel in order to facilitate the bypass. And um, so where do you find a blood vessel? Well, it turns out that uh, one of the, the first places that a surgeon will look is elsewhere in the patient's body. So some advantages of this, like any artificial organ or any organ that you want to transplant, you have the challenge of matching that transplant to the patient so that the patient doesn't reject it. You don't have to worry about this graft versus host disease, for example. So the way that, so, but uh, as you might imagine, a patient might be using that blood vessel that's found somewhere else in their body, either in their chest or in their leg or in their arm. Uh, furthermore, if that patient has unfortunately already had to have a bypass procedure or some other vascular procedure, they may not have blood vessels left in those other areas of their body that can be harvested um, for, for clinical use. Yet another problem is if a patient is going, undergoing bypass surgery in the first place, their arteries are probably not terribly healthy. And so this presents a, a major problem. Um, so where do we go to get blood vessels if we can't get them from these, these uh, patient, what's called an autologous source, so from the patient themselves? Um, and so this has been a, a problem that um, engineers and surgeons have been wrestling with for decades, is where do I come up with another material that I can use and not just for blood vessels, but for many other types of organs. And that's really kind of one of the central themes or one of the central problems we think about in biomedical engineering is how do I replace the function of tissues and organs? Um, so one of the first things that, that um, was developed were so-called synthetic materials. So it's a very material-centered approach. And it really depends on this notion that a blood vessel is really just a glorified tube, okay? So as long as, it's, as, long as this pipe is strong enough to withstand arterial blood pressure, and it doesn't uh, close up on its own, well then it should work just fine. So I should be able to pick up anything off the shelf and make myself a new pipe that I can just plug in. And so that was really um, the original, the first approach that was taken was to develop so-called synthetic vessels. And these things have been made of things uh, starting from, um, you know, from decades ago from nylon and now the ones that are behind me are made of Gore-Tex. So literally the same things that your camping gear or your rain parka are made of are used to make blood vessels that are implanted in patients. So again, as long as it's a strong tube, the body doesn't reject it, and it can carry blood, then, then we're good. So as long as it does no harm to the patient and can fulfill this function, you know, it's great. The problem is, if you, it turns out that if you need a blood vessel that's several centimeters wide or in diameter, then this works pretty well. But if you need one that's only a few millimeters in diameter, like you would for a bypass graft, like half a million patients in the United States alone each year need to have, then this doesn't quite cut it. So we've got to think about alternative approaches, and that's really where tissue engineering comes in. So we heard earlier about modularity, and I think when we think about really the ultimate success of tissue engineering, what we think about is a modular approach, where we can build an organ that will literally plug and play uh, into, into the patient. And so this is what we would really love to have. This is the dream, is to have a fully formed, fully functioning organ that we can make artificially off the shelf and it should have uh, several different properties. It should be living, ideally, so that it can fulfill the same function as the, uh, as the um, organ that we're trying to replace. Again, it should be functional. Uh, it should be growing, because if you think about it, especially if you want to treat a pediatric patient, a patient who's only a few years, a few months or a few years old, you don't want to give them that Gore-Tex Gore graft because 
the patient's going to grow larger and, and grow older. And just like outgrowing that Gore-Tex jacket, they could outgrow their graft. So to have something that's growing, but more importantly, again, the dream is to have something that's readily available. And so can we, as engineers, develop processes that will allow us to have these readily available? Okay. And so I just want to introduce you to one particular real, uh, what I would consider a, a success story in this field. Um, this uh, little girl that you can see here on the screen, her name is Angela. Um, when she was four years old, she had to undergo a procedure known as the Fontan procedure. She was born with a single ventricle. So that hopefully those of you who've had enough biology to know that there are two ventricles, uh, four two and four chambers in your heart. Um, and if you only have a single ventricle, then that ventricle has to be able to collect blood from deoxygenated blood uh, from the rest of your body, pump it to the lungs, and then pump uh, oxygenated blood to the rest of your body, and it has to perform both of those functions, whereas normally that's divided among the two sides of your heart. So what happens is this um, patients, uh, you may more commonly know this as, as blue baby syndrome, they don't have very good oxygenation, very good circulation. So patients with this condition have to undergo several operations in order to um, basically turn, replumb the heart, so to speak, so that the patient can function with only one blood vessel, or uh, sorry, with only one, um, with only one uh, ventricle. This uh, vessel that you're seeing in the top left-hand uh, corner is um, an artificial blood vessel that was designed by um, Chris Brewer and, uh, and Dr. Shinoka, which are pictured here. And basically, this is a, this is a uh, vessel. Before this, used to, they used to use Gore-Tex for this final procedure to try to shunt the deoxygenated blood directly to the lungs so that that left ventricle didn't have to do both jobs. And this is made out of a, a degradable material that's a lot like resorbable sutures, okay? And so now they're able to implant this. And after decades of preclinical research and a decade of clinical research by Dr. Shinoka in Japan, this was just recently, in the last few years, approved for, for FDA, uh, by the FDA for use in the United States. And the idea here is that you implant this tube that can resorb. And what happens is the body actually, the cells from the body will actually come in and will repopulate this. So they actually start the process by putting cells from the patient onto this, uh, onto this resorbable tube, implanted in the patient, and ultimately within a year or two, the patient's own blood vessel, the patient's own cells have replaced it. So this is kind of a remarkable idea that we can use a resorbable material. But again, we're really relying on a material in order to replace this, this function. So enter another kind of an interesting example of a vascular graft that was made. This is much smaller. This is a couple of millimeters in diameter. Uh, and then again, trying to address the need for a graft that matches the patient and can, and can re replicate this function. And so what these guys did was they came, they, uh, this is a, a, a approach that ultimately has been developed by a company called Cytograph Tissue Engineering. Um, and what they've done is they said, well, you know, if we need to have cells and we need to have materials, cells are actually pretty good at synthesizing materials on their own. And if we want cells from the patient, one of the challenges is then we've got to grow up all these cells. That takes time. It takes money, you know, to make a product that can go back into the patient. So what they did was they actually took kind of a clever approach where they take a piece of skin from the patient and they grow it up and they take the connective tissue cells from that skin and they grow them up into these sheets, which is shown uh, this, this uh, far at the third circle there on the right. So they make these sheets, and these sheets are really strong. Cells make this really strong structural protein called collagen. And then they actually take those sheets and they roll them up like a little jelly roll, basically. And they, make a, they, make a, uh, they let those, those cells remodel and turn into a tube. And then they take some uh, cells that they also collected from the skin that line the inside of it. And ultimately, what they end up with is this nice blood vessel. This takes months to produce, but it's made entirely from the patient's own cells. It's only a few millimeters in diameter, um, and it's ready, and they've been able to use this clinically as well. Now, one of the challenges that these guys have is to make those cells grow up all these all the, all the sheets and to make them make the vessel, it takes weeks, even months, in order to do this. So cells work really well, but they work very slowly, and so uh, this is a challenge that they've had. And also, you can imagine that if a patient needs uh, bypass surgery, they're going to need it pretty quick. So this isn't great for emergency applications. So what they did was they actually tested their application in uh, patients who needed arteriovenous fistulas, veins that could withstand multiple punctures for dialysis. And there are a lot of those such patients in the United States as well. And so they've been successful um, at that. Um, and so, uh, so now building on that, so now we've got entirely cell-derived tissue that's a few millimeters in diameter, functions just like an artery or vein, which is really exciting, patient matched, and it works in people who are much older than our pediatric patients who can heal really well. So this is a really exciting advance in the field. 
And one of the most recent advances is that this, this company and another company, Humicite, have found that they can make these artificial blood vessels. And now, instead of dealing with this problem of having to wait for cells to grow up and taking the cost and everything associated with cells and growing up cells in culture, um, they can actually strip the cells out. And it turns out that that material that the cells have made is strong enough to withstand the arterial pressures, but now they can strip the cells away. And what that means is all the elements that would lead to rejection are now gone, and now they've got a material that's much closer to something that they could actually pull off the shelf, like our synthetic, our Gore-Tex graphs I showed you at the beginning, but they have these other functionalities. And so these are, this is sort of the, the cutting edge of where we are now, is to see whether or not these materials that were made entirely from cells, um, whether or not they're, they're going to be uh, capable of, of performing the same uh, successfully in the clinic. Um, and it, the holy grail still is this idea of being able to make an artificial graft for coronary artery bypass. That hasn't been achieved yet. Um, and so stay tuned, because this is a, a very rapidly developing field with a lot of exciting new developments. But back to the question of function. We know that blood vessels have this, uh, this medial layer which has smooth muscle cells in it. And all of, the, all of the grafts that have been used successfully clinically so far don't have vascular smooth muscle cells. And why does that matter? Well, smooth muscle, cell, muscle cells allow the, the blood vessels to change their diameter, to relax and contract. And it's almost like if the pipes in your, in your house could change their diameter and change their flow uh, to meet demands, like if somebody's taking a shower versus using the dishwasher or something, for example. Uh, not only that, but one of the early visions for tissue engineering was that we'd be able to make blood vessels or, or be able to make organs and tissues of human origin so that we could better understand how these uh, human tissues are put together, how they function, their structure, how cells work together. And if we had a three-dimensional human uh, equivalent of a tissue, um, which aren't readily available off the shelf, it would help us to better understand disease. So in this case, vascular disease. How do all these cells, how do all these structural proteins work together? And if we don't have a functioning vessel, then that doesn't work uh, very well. So uh, all the, the tricks and techniques and design characteristics that we've used for in, vi in vivo transplantation haven't necessarily translated to something that's going to be a contractile functional blood vessel. So that's kind of where, where um, our lab has sort of tried to come up with some alternatives. And so basically what we decided was, well, Cells are great tissue engineers. Um, they make all the structures in our body. If we could come up with a way to make engineered blood vessels entirely from cells, you know, then we'd really have something. But it turns out that making tubes requires a lot of cells. So instead of just making a vessel, we decided to focus on making rings. And there are really good reason for this. Uh, mainly, if uh, traditionally, when we wanted to understand vascular function, one really sort of more high throughput way to do this would be to cut a blood vessel up into ring segments because we can then use those rings. We can pull on them and see how strong they are. And then we can also measure how, mo how well they can contract. Um, and so that's what we, were, we set out to do. So this is an example of a, a stress strain curve. Um, what you can see there is this little ring. It looks like, my colleagues have told me it looks like calamari to them. So we call this, this is our myocalamari, we now call it. So this is a little ring that's made of cells that s aggregate together to make a little ring-like structure. It's a tissue that's made entirely from aggregated cells. So these cells have proteins that allow them to make connections, and then they'll actually aggregate into a, a three-dimensional structure. Um, and so we have this uh, situated on little pins. So after we painstakingly put these cells together to make a ring, we pull on it until we break it. That's what we like to do. As That's the difference between engineers and biologists, is we, we like to, to break things and see how strong they are. Um, also, theoretically, this is work we're just getting started on. We can measure the amount of contractions. So this is so you can see the force um, that's generated as we stimulate these to contract. And this is actually, in full disclosure, this is a mouse aortic ring segment. And this isn't ours yet, but that's where we're headed. So now we've got a nice little ring structure that's conducive to, to, to breaking, and it's also conducive to, uh, to looking at strength and, and also to contraction. So how did we do this? So um, this is a video that we, that, uh, we produced with uh, the Journal of Visualized Experiments a, number of, a couple of years ago, so I'm just going to run through this real quick. Basically what we did was we used the engineering tools we have here at WPI. We created a ring-shaped mold, we say it's kind of like a bunt cake. It's got a ring, it's got a uh, ring-shaped structure with rounded bottoms. This yellow stuff is a, a plastic elastomer that we cast over top of it. And then we cast uh, this agarose, which is the orange stuff. And what it does is it creates a, a, a rounded bottom, ring-shaped well that we can seed our cells into. And they can't stick to it, so they settle into the bottoms, as you saw in the video, and then they 
come together and eventually they'll contract. And by having this little post in the middle, it constrains the contraction of this little ball of cells. So we end up with something that's ring shaped. And this is kind of what it looks like here. You can see there's uh, the pink stuff is the agarose, and then that little white ring in the middle is the ring that I showed you that we had suspended. And we've scaled up this process. So these are some human smooth muscle cell rings. There's five of them in this well, um, pointed out by the arrows. So we're trying to scale up this process now to develop a system. But I started out this talk telling you that we wanted to build blood vessels. So one of the other questions that we've been addressing in my lab is, can we now take these living cell-based ring structures and use them as modular building units to make tubes? And so this is a question that, um, that we then looked at. And this is so here up on the, uh, you can see one of our ring structures. And this little video clip uh, shows what happens when we culture them for seven days, we can harvest them. They look like little SpaghettiOs. These are about two, milli these are two millimeters in diameter. They've been in culture for seven days. And we can actually take those individual ring units and then we can put them onto a uh, tubular structure and we push them together so that they're in contact and then we can culture them for another week. Um, and we've been working on the kinetics of this and it turns out that if you come back a week later and take these out, um, because these are living, remodelable structures, they'll have, they've fused into to form a tubular unit. So we think we can also use these as building blocks, not just as in vitro myocalamari to get uh, measurements of how um, the matrix proteins the cells make and the cells themselves contribute to function and structure in the tissues. So um, the take home message of all of this is cells are really good tissue engineers. We wouldn't be standing here if cells weren't capable of making, you know, we all start from a single cell that becomes billions of cells, 250 different specialized cell types in our bodies that perform every function and build every tissue, including bone, skin, everything. So cells are really good at tissue engineering. And so uh, we think that sort of moving forward that there's a lot of opportunity to just use cells and cells to make 3D structures that will help us better understand human organ function, hopefully toward better therapies. Um, and that's it. These are the students who did the work. So one of the other things, uh, you know, not only are cells great tissue engineers, so are students. And one of the ways we innovate in my lab is to continue bringing in younger, smarter people than me uh, to actually develop the systems and do the work. Um, this is the rest of my lab currently. I have a lot of really great students here at WPI, a lot of great collaborators who, who help us with the work that we do. Um, and that's usually where I end is with questions. But thank you very much for your attention.